Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Sheetal Parikh from Cincinnati Children's, Ohio. Dr. Parikh is a professor of orthopedic surgery and co-director of Orthopedic Sports Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, United States. He specializes in pediatric sports medicine with clinical and research interests focused on pedal instability, pediatric ACL injuries, arthroscopic treatment of joint instability, and pediatric trauma. After completion of his orthopedic residency from India, he completed fellowships in joint reconstruction at Hospital for Joint Disease New York, pediatric orthopedics at the Cincinnati Children's, a trauma fellowship at the Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, and a sports medicine fellowship in Cincinnati under Dr. Frank Noyce. He has published several scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals and has been the editor of two books, Pediatric ACL and Petal Instability. He was awarded the Isacos Petalofemoral Traveling Fellowship in October 2014. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Sheetal Pari from Cincinnati, Ohio. Over to you, Sheetal. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, where, wherever you are. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Gopalan for inviting me uh, to present on a, a topic that I'm very passionate about, pediatric ACL tears. Uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, we, uh, uh, we wrote uh, the, uh, the, the book on pediatric ACL. I was able to get uh, support from a lot of, uh, you know, authors who contributed, who were actually, uh, who had pioneered and had originated a lot of the techniques that I'm going to be talking about. So it's a good resource uh, uh, if uh, someone wants to have a look at it. Um, I'm based in Cincinnati. I'm, I work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and um, I would um, like to welcome you all for this uh, uh, presentation on pediatric ACL tear and tibial spine fractures. The purpose of my talk is to review the latest trends in management of pediatric ACL injuries, to provide an update on management of tibial spine avulsion fractures, to review the uh, poles and pitfalls of uh, surgical uh, techniques for pediatric ACL reconstruction. Uh, I'll start with the case, a 12-year-old boy who jumped down the stairs. He landed wrong and injured his knee. He heard a pop. He had pain. He was unable to bear weight. He had moderate effusion and a positive Lockman test with a very soft endpoint. These are his x-rays, and as one can see, he has open growth plates, uh, both on the femur and the tibia, and uh, his MRI showed a complete ACL tear and no meniscus injury. This is his full length x-ray, which we get on every patient at baseline, especially those who are skeletally immature. One is to look at the alignment and also to make sure that they don't have any growth disturbances moving forward. So the, here, uh, so the medical decision-making points are, uh, you know, what are the treatment options, how we determine the skeletal maturity, and if operative, what are the surgical techniques? And there are so many of them there that have been described. Uh, so when we look at the options, there are, uh, you know, broadly categorized in three uh, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, sections. The first one is observation. And I've seen even in, uh, you know, pretty uh, advanced, uh, you know, uh, medical institutions where we have uh, uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine surgeons, a lot of uh, the adult sports uh, surgeons would recommend observation. One is that they don't want to get into the uh, growth arrest or growth disturbance issues. And they think it's okay to wait till the child is mature. So some of them would go to rehab and then return to sports if you are not symptomatic. And then they would uh, uh, treat them only if symptomatic or they would deliberately delay the surgery till they are scheduled to maturity. So is that a good option? Uh, if you look at the natural history of untreated ACL, and there are several publications, including a lot of recent systematic reviews, and the natural history of untreated ACL is not good. If you look at this uh, uh, study that was published in 2021 uh, on systematic review and meta-analysis of early versus delayed versus non-operative treatment, they compiled 30 studies and non-operative treatment increased the instability, increased meniscus tears, and decreased the return to sports. And delayed treatment, even delayed by more than 12 weeks, led, led to increased rates of irreparable meniscus tears. Another study here, which is a compilation of nine studies, more than 1,300 patients with a mean age of 14.2 years, they found that its ACL reconstruction would decrease the rate of secondary meniscal injuries. But more important, they also found that if you don't treat these injuries, then there is a higher rate of medial, lateral, and patellofemoral chondral damage. So 
if we don't treat these patients with, uh, with uh, surgery, then the natural history of untreated ACL is not good. So I would not recommend the observation group. Now let's look at the select patient group where you can think that only if the patient is an athlete or if the patient is fit, then we should do a reconstruction. If the patient is say sedentary or obese and is not gonna do much, do these patients do well without surgery? So if you look at the rates of meniscus tears in patients with ACL based on age and body mass index, then for every year of increase in age, there is significant increased risk of meniscus tear. And if the patient is obese, it doesn't give them any protection. Actually, it's, it's counterproductive. For every two-point increase in BMI, there is significant increased risk of meniscus tear. So I don't think that selecting patient uh, is a good idea as well. So in short, what you're left with is the option of fixing it. So I would fix it at any age. Whenever the child presents, we have done, done ACL reconstruction in kids who are five years of age or they're skeletally mature and going all the way in the adolescent age group. There are issues that we need to be aware of so we can prevent complication. Here is a case report of a valgus deformity after ACL, but you can obviously see that there is an implant going across the physis. So obviously we don't wanna do that, otherwise the patient would, would definitely have growth disturbances. When we looked at the systematic review of growth disturbances after ACL in Im immature patients, the rate of deformity is not significant, is 1.3%, mainly valgus and general Recovatum, and uh, you may not think of it as if uh, uh, the leg would grow longer, but it can stimulate the growth plate in very young patients, and the patients can actually have a limb length discrepancy where the where the involved or the operated side is more than two centimeter longer than the other side, which might require some intervention. So how do we do ACL reconstruction in children? The first thing we want to do is to assess how much growth is remaining. So if you look at these girls, they're all same age. They're all 11 years old, but it's not a reliable indicator because you can see that the growth remaining in this girls is not the same. They're all different constitutionally. They are different as well as the amount of uh, maturity. It would be different in each, of, each one of them. So there are several ways to assess the maturity. One of them is tenor staging, which has been published quite a bit, but in the hands of orthopedic surgeon, tenor staging is not a very useful uh, um, a way of uh, deciding the maturity. If we look at the reliability of tenor staging by orthopedic surgeons, the accuracy is less than 60%. Above that, it's difficult to do it in a clinical setting. So I would use a left-hand x-ray and you can look at the bone age based on the atlas. The other cheap or fast way of determining skeletal maturity is looking at the distal phalangeal physis. If the distal phalangeal physis are open, the patient is prepubescent. That means the patient has not reached the peak height velocity and has more than two years of growth remaining. Like in this patient, you can see the distal phalangeal physis are open. If these physis are closing or close, then the patient has reached the peak height velocity and the remaining growth is less than two years, like in this patient. So that's a little bit easy way of trying to determine not exactly the bone age, but how much of growth is remaining. And I use this, this is based off on work from uh, scoliosis uh, uh, studies by Sanders. Uh, there is also a knee atlas that have been, we have been looking at uh, closely on the MRI. The center part of the tibial physis closes the first. So if there is closure of the physis um, in the center part of the tibia, then in that case, we would uh, uh, proceed uh, with a transphysial reconstruction or consider the patient to be skeletally mature. As far as the techniques are concerned, we can broadly divide the techniques in three different groups. One of them is the one with no tunnels. It was original Macintosh procedure, but later on written uh, quite a bit uh, for ACL reconstruction in immature patients by McKilly and Coker. Uh, the epiphyseal technique, the center one, is where you drill tunnels, but you stay within the epiphysis uh, of the, uh, of around the knee. This was first described by Anderson. There are a lot of variations that have been described uh, after the original technique was published. And then the transphysial reconstruction, where you can go through the physis uh, and do an adult type procedure, of course, with some principles in mind. So my algorithm is I use all three techniques based on the patient's uh, age and remaining growth. So my algorithm is that for a prepubescent patient, typically nine, 10 years, nine or 10 years of boy, um, 
And uh, tenor stage one or two, I would use the um, McKaylee Coker uh, technique where I don't have to drill any tunnels, use the iliotibial bend. Uh, for the epiphyseal, I would use it when the patient is still having two years of growth remaining, but has a little bit uh, advanced uh, uh, maturity. Uh, typically, uh, patients greater than ten years of age, um, and uh, they would they should have a minimum, um, you know, height of the tibial physis to drill through it. And then transphysal is the patients who are pubescent, who, uh, who do not have more than two years of growth remaining. They're tenor stage four or five, typically adolescent, more than 13 years of age. So we'll look at this example of an eight-year-old boy with an ACL tear after fall from a bike. These are the x-rays. So I would use the iliotibial bend technique where you harvest the iliotibial bend uh, some of the ACL sets come with the meniscotome. You can also get it, uh, you know, outside of the set. You can just purchase these are old instruments. If you don't have a meniscotome, you can use long scissors and slide it up all the way. Uh, you need about 20 centimeter of a graft, and then you can make a counter incision proximally and cut the iliotibial band. You leave it attached at its insertion over the Gordius tubercle. Then we uh, put a clamp on in the knee joint and pull the graft uh, in the knee joint like this and it go underneath the intrameniscal ligament and then fix it uh, to the periosteum over the ent entromedial aspect of the tibia. And you do them some uh, suturing of the graft uh, at the uh, lateral aspect of the femur, which reproduces the extra articular uh, part of the reconstruction, just like any lateral sided procedure that we do in adult ACL. So I'll show you the technique in this patient here. You can see the incision on the lateral side for the iliotibial bend harvest. This is examination under anesthesia show, showing positive pivot shift. Uh, we do a debridement. We have to keep, we don't do a notch plastic because the physis is very close to the posterior aspect of the notch. We harvest the graft. We put the clamp through the notch on the lateral side in over the top position and we push the clamp to come out of the incision that we use to harvest iliotibial band, like you can see here. And then we can pull the graft in the knee joint so it's lying in over the top position. And then anteriorly, we make a groove underneath the intrameniscal ligament, pull the graft through it, and then we suture the graft on the anteromedial aspect as shown here. This is the same kid. You have the two incisions. You can see this is a, a follow-up of that patient. Uh, we use the same technique for patients with congenital absence of ACL as seen here. Uh, one way to know that the patient has absence and it's not a tear is that the tibial spine is covered with cartilage. There was never an ACL in the first place. These patients can have instability if they are undergoing any uh, type of uh, uh, lengthening any type of uh, stabilization uh, for other uh, 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 issues because they may have dysplasia, they may have other things uh, associated with an absent ACL. So the outcomes of this physis sparing ACL reconstruction, this is a study uh, with a mean age of 11.2 years and 237 patients. The graft rupture rate is very acceptable, 6.6%, and there were no deformities or limb length discrepancy. And you would not expect that based on no tunnels that you have drilled, so your physis are spared. 48% of the patient did report some lateral thigh asymmetry, but only a few had pain. So I do explain the patients that when we harvest iliotibial band, they can notice some fullness of the thigh later on in follow-up. As you can see in this example, this is a patient who was uh, referred uh, because of asymmetry of the thigh. He, uh, this patient was uh, an adult, uh, five years post-op, and uh, because of this bulge on the lateral side, the patient went and saw a tumor surgeon who was ready to do a biopsy of that, thinking that this is a muscle uh, tumor. And uh, when I saw the patient, uh, uh, the patient had uh, the iliotibial band harvested. So this is something that is common. The patient does not need a biopsy. You just have to let them know that uh, uh, this is something that can happen. It's a complication of iliotibial band harvest, but most of the patients are asymptomatic. Let's look at the second technique, which is the epiphyseal ACL reconstruction, where you're going to be putting the graft within the epiphysis of the distal femur and the proximal tibia. There are several different modifications. The initial technique where you use a suspensory fixation on the femur side, and then you use a post below the level of the physis was described by Anderson with very good results. 
Uh, however, in theory, there is a concern that, you know, uh, fixing the graft across the physis in front of the tibia may tether the, um, the, uh, the tibial growth. In the clinical series, there was no issues with growth disturbances, but the one way to avoid putting the graft on top of the uh, physis is to use a complete epiphyseal technique. This is my partner, Dr. Wall's technique, where we use split tunnels in the tibia and then use an interference screw on, in the femur. This is the technique that I use. The, there are two advantages of this technique. One is that since you split the graft in two parts, the size of the tibial tunnel is much smaller. And the other advantage is that you are looping the graft around a bone bridge so that you don't have to use any implant in the tibia because in a younger patient, I just feel that using an implant in the tibial tunnel may lead to some osteolysis, which can later cause some issues if it breaks uh, towards the physis or in the articular surface. So in this technique, there are no implants that are used and the uh, size of the tibial tunnel is pretty small, typically around four to 4.5 millimeter. So this is our case that I first started with, and this, that is what I would recommend for this patient, since the patient has a decent um, uh, you know, size of the proximal tibial epiphysis. So uh, as far as technique is concerned, we use a freehand technique, use fluoroscopic guidance. We drill from outside in for the femur. And then for the tibia, I'll use this technique, use a guide just like you would do for an adult ACL, but keep the tibial tunnel within the epiphysis. I drill two guide pins. This is the first guide pin, then a second guide pin. And on outside, you can see that there is a one centimeter bone bridge between the two uh, guide pins. And that is where the graph would be looped. Uh, this is after the placement of the guide pins. You can see the uh, femur guide pin is below the level of the physis and then two guide pin in the ACL footprint. And once you get the guide pin, your surgery is you know, almost done. You just have to drill on this and pass the graft. So uh, when we loop the graft, this is how it looks on the anterior aspect of the tibia. And uh, the intra-articular part of the graph would look like this, two bundles. This is not a double bundle ACL. It just happens that we are drilling two tunnels in the tibia. So you'll have two bundles of the ACL. And then we put an interference screw on the femoral side. And this is a one-year follow-up on that, that patient. The white arrows indicate the park Harris line, which are the growth recovery lines that are used to monitor the growth after any surgery or after any injury in a patient with open physis. As long as these lines are parallel to the physis, we know that there is no growth arrest. On the right side, you can see the placement of the interference screw within the femoral physis, as well as the tibial tunnel within the tibial epiphysis. This is a full length x-ray of that patient and you can see no limb length discrepancy or change in alignment. As far as positioning, because you want to visualize this, uh, uh, the knee in AP and lateral views, we bump up the involved side so that you can get a lateral view very easily. As far as the femoral tunnel um, is concerned, uh, uh, we do an outside in femoral uh, drilling uh, technique where we would put our guide pin as shown here, we'll check under fluoro. The landmarks of the guide pin are in the posterior one fourth um, and uh, 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 proximal one fourth of the epiphysis of the, of the femur. So that's the point that you want to in, uh, put your guide pin in. And we also use arthroscopy besides fluoroscopy to visualize and make sure that the guide pin is coming out at the footprint of the ACL. This is the uh, fluoroscopic uh, uh, view of the guide pin. Then we would uh, drill into the uh, tibial tunnel. Um, uh, this is just using a jig. I usually keep it at around 50 to 55 degrees of an angle and uh, make sure that I'm cleared of the proximal tibial uh, physis. And then you would drill just like in an adult ACL uh, procedure. Once the guide pins are placed, then you would use the uh, reamer and you would uh, ream the, um, the canal. And also during reaming, we'll make sure that we check with fluoroscopy to make sure that we are not violating the physis. This is the femoral tunnel. And then we'll drill the tibial tunnel. And then it's just a matter of passing the graft. We use a uh, wire loop in the femoral tunnel, grab it from the tibial tunnel and pass the graft. So that's about the epiphyseal technique. The transphyseal technique uh, is used uh, in uh, pubescent patients who have two years or less, two, less than two years of growth remaining. 
One thing is that if you use a transtibial technique for femoral draining, then it's less oblique and leads to less than 5% physal violation. So animal studies have shown that if you keep the physal violation to less than 5% and you fill the tunnel with some soft tissue graft, then the growth arrest rates are not there. So the, those are the principles, soft tissue graft, fixation away from the physis, and um, no implants around the physis. We do not do notch blast in these patients because the physis is very close to the posterior aspect of the notch. This is an example showing that, you know, the medial portal that we typically use for anatomic ACL reconstruction and in adults would take down more physis because it's oblique in orient orientation. And that's why a trans technique might be more appropriate because it would take down less amount of physis. With the medial portal, the physal violation goes to around 7%. And as I said, 5% is the goal that your violation should be less than 5% when you're going through this open physis. Same uh, with the size of the graft. You don't want to make too big of a tunnel. So if you, you can see that if you go with a nine millimeter tunnel, then it does uh, lead to more than 5% of physal violation. So I typically like to keep my graft size at around eight. This is um, an arthroscopic view of the trans uh, physial tibial tunnel. And you can see the physis as a white mark um, and it goes all the way around. I typically don't have to do this when I'm doing surgery. This is just for demonstration showing the physis. Uh, in the tibial tunnel. And same on the femoral tunnel. One thing to see is that you see the back wall of the femur and you can see the physis, how close they are. And that is why doing a nosplasty can injure the physis. They are very close. And that's why we don't want to do um, a nosplasty in these patients. This is the uh, typical orientation. We are using a suspensory fixation away from the physis on the femur. Here I'm measuring the uh, length of the uh, tibial tunnel. And then we put with uh, put the interference screw. This is an MRI of the same patient one year later for another injury where you can see the ACL graft. Um, and you can also, what you can also see here is that the screw is not uh, violating the tibial physis as well. It is just up to the physis. So you don't want to put a screw across the physis. This is four years later, no limb length discrepancy, no deformity. As far as graft options, I choose to use hamstring grafts. Uh, I would uh, you know, five-fold the graft or six-fold it to get to an eight millimeter diameter if the graft size is smaller. Having said that, the original technique, which was published by Anderson, they also used uh, uh, graft, uh, just quadruple graft, does not matter what the diameter was. And the thinking was that younger patients, you can, can have smaller grafts. I still aim for eight millimeter grafts, but in that study, the original publication, there were graft diameters for a quadruple hamstring, which measured six millimeters and the patient did well. So you can also use iliotibial band. Quad tendon has been getting uh, a lot of attention nowadays because of the uh, strength of the graft. There are some publications. This is two years ago in AJSM where they use quad tendon for epiphyseal ACL reconstruction. Now in high risk patients, that means that those who have uh, those which are revision cases, those who have large pivot shift, they have small size or graph. For me, small size means less than eight. If they have hyperlaxity, genu recovata more than 10 degrees, then I would add a lateral extra articular tenodesis to these patients when I'm doing epiphyseal or transphyseal ACL reconstruction. The way I do it is harvest the iliotibial band on the lateral side put it under the lateral collateral ligament and then fix it below the level of the physis. You can see I use a staple, but you can use a suture anchor. You can drill a tunnel if you have space, um, but I prefer to use a, a staple below the level of the physis for my extra articular reconstruction. Uh, We'll just move a little bit off to the uh, ACL aversion, which is a tibial spine fracture, because a lot of times in, in children, we'll see a tibial spine aversion or an ACL aversion rather than a mid-substance ACL tear. This is an eight-year-old girl who fell off her bike. Now, the things that we have to decide is how do we classify this, whether we need a CT or MRI for these patients, and how would you treat them? Would you recommend close reduction and casting? 
what are the fixation options and the most common complication, which is arthrofibrosis, how can you prevent that? So this is a type two where it's hinged uh, in the backside. A type three would be a complete uh, avulsion and a type four would be one with combination. So a CT or MRI for me, it does not help me too much. You can look at this study where they did CT on the tibial spine and the visibility of all the margins improved. But if I'm going at doing an arthroscopic surgery, I'll be able to see everything very well. So to me, a CT scan is not necessary for these patients unless there is some complex injury where there are fracture lines in the tibial plateau, then it might be worth checking with a CT scan if you need any additional fixation besides the tibial avulsion fracture fixation. Uh, about the MRI, um, you know, this study showed that 40% uh, of the patient had meniscus tears on the MRI uh, in tibial uh, uh, spine fractures. There were four medial, four lateral. Uh, I think it is beneficial to use an MRI if you're planning conservative treatment to make sure there is no meniscus interposition, which would prevent the tibial spine fracture from reducing. So if you're planning close treatment, then I think that it might help because if I'm doing an arthroscopic surgery, I'm going to be checking the meniscus anyways. So there is more um, you know, um, support for getting MRIs for tibial spine fracture. I don't usually get MRI on these patients. When we look at the meniscus entrapment, you know, 26% of type 2 and more than half of type 3 patients had meniscus entrapment between the uh, fracture fragment and, and the crater. Medial meniscus more than the intrameniscal ligament, more than the lateral meniscus and this is responsible for failure of conservative treatment. Now, would you close reduce this patient that I just showed? My experience with close reduction is that uh, I'm not very successful with close reduction. So this patient had an attempt of a cast and a reduction, but you can see post-reduction x-rays. I was not really happy with it. So my practice is not to attempt close reduction and casting for displaced tibial spine fracture. Only for those which are undisplaced, I would put them in a cast. The second reason for not casting this patient is the risk of arthrofibrosis. I want rigid fixation. I want them to be moving early. So I fix all displaced fractures. I don't attempt close reduction. How about malunion? So this patient, if you don't do anything to this patient, they can have a malunion and they would then lack extension because this piece is going to cause impingement in the notch. This is two years post-injury treated somewhere else, and this is not acceptable. How about fixation techniques? So you can use a screw or you can use a suture. Both have good results. You can also use epiphyseal versus transphyseal fixation, and studies have not shown any significant difference in the outcome. This is a systematic review of 16 studies comparing suture with screw fixation. No difference in subjective instability or future need for ACL reconstruction. However, when you put a transphyseal screw, you have to remove it. So there is a second surgery involved with transphyseal screws. Another review gave, um, another systematic review had similar findings that no difference whether you treat this with suture or with screws. Also, there is no difference whether you treat them through scope or you open. So if you do a mini arthrotomy and you have to treat it and you're not used to scope, that's fine. There is no significant difference seen in outcomes whether we treat this with a scope or um, with uh, with open techniques. I prefer to use the scope. For me, it is quick. The rehab is uh, is quicker and I can examine the entire joint before I address the tibia spine with the scope, which you are limited when you're opening it. The main concern is arthrofibrosis, as seen in this report, 32 patients had arthrofibrosis, and it could be in either direction, flexion loss, extension loss, and 11 patients had loss in both flexion and extension. When they tried to manipulate, three patients had distal femur fractures, which would further complicate this, uh, this injury. So arthrofibrosis is a big risk. And how do you prevent arthrofibrosis is by anatomic fixation, rigid fixation, and early mobilization. So one of the reasons that tibial spine fractures have increased arthrofibrosis is because we treat them as fractures and approach them early. There is a school of thought of delaying surgery for three or four weeks, just like you would do an ACL reconstruction. My concern is the quality of reduction that I may not be able to achieve if I'm delaying the surgery. But there are physicians who are delaying surgery just to prevent arthrofibrosis. We were able to show in a consecutive series of more than 25 patients that we could prevent arthrofibrosis by using screw fixation. And I tend to use a transphysis screw because I had, had an experience of uh, 
um, epiphysis screw not having good hold in the epiphysis. I've seen uh, it backing out like seen on this uh, patient here. I tend to go with a transvisor screw. The only thing is I have to tell the patient I'm upfront that you know between three and four months, I'm gonna go back in to remove the screw since it's going through the physis. If you tell the families upfront, then I don't think it's an issue, but of course it's a second surgery. So we have to think about it. If you, if you put a transvice screw and don't remove it, then you're going to have complications like shown in this patient. The patient had general recovatum. So in our case, which I showed, this patient had um, a, a tibial spine avulsion. This is my setup for the OR. I want to make sure that I can bump up the involved side so I can get a really good lateral view. And I start and do my arthroscopy, keep the C-arm like this for most of the part of the case. I make my portals the typical anterolateral and anteromedial portal, but my screw fixation is through the medial mid patellar portal. So I make my portals uh, uh, when I start the case, but you can obviously needle localize it uh, once you put your scope in, and then you can make your mid patellar portal to make sure you can get the right trajectory to put your screw in. So the mid patellar portal, I also put a K wire through this mid patellar portal to reduce the fracture and then put another K wire to put a candidate screw on top of it. So this is the portal um, a creation. This is getting into the uh, um, uh, joint, and then you would uh, elevate the crater, clean up the uh, fracture bed, and then I would fix uh, the fracture with one uh, one pin first. You can use the this pin to joystick the fragment, so you can get an anatomic reduction. You can use a probe. Uh, to keep the meniscus out of the fracture bed. There are other ways of doing it. You can also put a K wire right where the probe is, and that would also keep the meniscus out of the uh, fracture site. Or you can pass a suture around the meniscus and pull it out. So there are different ways of keeping the meniscus out of the fracture bed. So once we fix it tentatively and you check the reduction, you're happy with it, then I'll put another pin in the position where I want to put my screw. So this is a second pin um, in position. I check it with fluoro, make sure I like it. And then I would uh, put my screw in. Now, one thing I would do when I'm putting my screw is that I will use a washer and I'll put a suture, a non-absorbable suture around the washer. And I leave a tail of about uh, uh, eight to 10 millimeters long tail. And the reason to do this is that when I go back in to remove the screw, the suture would guide me. Um, and if you're not able to back out the screw when you're, when you're trying to remove it and it's just spinning, then you can pull on the sutures and that would help to pull the screw out. So I use this uh, technique uh, of putting the uh, screw with uh, the uh, washer and a suture around it. And this is a post-op image. These are the post-op x-rays. And then at three months when I go in, so if I did not have the suture, then your screw is budded because there is scar tissue and uh, ACL that would grow on top of it. Then you would have to dig in to remove the screw. But you, as you can see, my sutures would allow me to go exactly where the screw is without damaging anything. Make sure that I don't lose my washer either because there is a screw around the washer and it's, we can remove the screw with minimum um, uh, damage to the ACL. So this is a one year post-op on the patient. Uh, how about this patient? It's a 14 year old patient with a ski injury. Now, if you have a really small type four comminuted or cartilaginous fragment of tibial spine, then you cannot put a screw in because there is not enough bone. In these cases, a suture fixation is better. And uh, sometimes you would use hybrid fixation, which means that I'll put a suture around. And if there are smaller fragments with still some ACL attached to it, then I would fix it with some anchors like shown here. I use the anchors that I would typically use in shoulder surgery, and I will fix the um, anchor in front of the uh, tibia. So you use a suture fixation, pull it out through the transtibial uh, pullout technique, and then I would use anchors to further fix it if needed. One thing we have to explain the family that these patients with tibial spine may have had a stretch of the ACL, so they would have some laxity. And then this study showed about 19% requiring ACL reconstruction later on. Um, my experience is that uh, it's not this high. Um, my experience, maybe 5% of the patients may require an ACL reconstruction. But this study showed that even with a type one fracture, 
they had patients requiring ACL reconstruction. And the theory is that to, to get an ACL aversion, the ACL has to pull on the piece, which would stretch the ACL and it, it can become incompetent. So even with the type one fracture, they showed that the patient had ACL insufficiency at a later stage. In summary, the pediatric sports medicine is an evolving subspecialty. Pediatric ACL tears and tibial spine fractures are diagnosed more often than before. You need to use an age appropriate surgical technique, which is Pfizer respecting and complications can happen. We get, got to learn from it. And if you are an adult uh, sports person, it's better to have a pediatric orthopedic colleague who can help you in either in the primary surgery or if you have any issues later on. But I would not delay surgery till the patient is scheduled mature just because of the risk involved with the chondral damage, meniscus tears, and recurrent instability. So I would like to treat these patients when the injury happens. Thank you. Thank you, Sheetal, for that brilliant presentation, really cutting edge work that you're doing at Cincinnati. Uh, Sheetal, you can stop sharing actually. Okay. okay. Uh, Sheetal, a couple of questions from our side. Uh, it's just uh, because a lot of surgeons would be really interested in this particular technique uh, because most of them would like to do a pediatric ACL. So one of the things is uh, we, when we talk about the femoral footprint, uh, we generally hyperflex the knee, right, to get the uh, femoral, uh, so do you think in a uh, pediatric, we follow the similar technique, uh, when, especially when you're doing the ap you identify the footprint, do you hyperflex the knee? So the, you need the hyperflexion when you are using the accessory medial portal. We use an outside in technique. So I just keep the knee at 90 degrees. There is no need for hyperflexion, but you are right. If you are going to do an accessory medial portal just to get the clearance and not to have a blowout, you do have to hyperflex the knee, but we, we don't want to do it that way because if, you, if you're using accessory medial portal and putting your guide pin in the footprint, you would violate the physis. I showed you how close the physis is. So what you want to do is you want to come below the physis, parallel to the physis, and that's why we use an outside in technique. So there is no need for hyperflexion. Okay. So in a, what about a transphysial in that one? Third, so in transphysial, I prefer I prefer to use the transtibial drilling technique. Where you don't have to hyperflex. So I try to avoid the anteromedial portal because of the risk of increased damage to the physis. Now, if you are really close to maturity, like if the physis is closing down, the patient is around 15 years of age, you don't expect more than a year of growth remaining. You can do an accessory medial portal, flex it, and not worry about any growth disturbances if they have like six months or a year of growth remaining. But if they truly have two years of growth remaining, then you want to be careful how much physis you want to violate. In those cases, if I'm doing transphysial, I would prefer to do a transtibial technique, but the transtibial is not putting the graph vertical. You know, it depends on how you put your tibial tunnel. You know, your femoral tunnel is dictated by your tibial tunnel. I would make sure that I would, you know, put my jig on the tibia about 35 degrees in a coronal plane so I can still get a little bit lower down. But do, do, doing transphysial would allow, uh, you know, would prevent too much of physal violation compared to accessory medial. Thank you, Sheetal, for that. And I think well, one of the uh, in one of your slides, I think one of the key points when you do an epiphyseal uh, reconstruction is the obliquity of the tibial epiphysis, right? It is slightly lower on the anterior aspect. So you, you are able to start the entry point much lower, isn't it? So, you know, that that's in, you know, when you think about it, it may seem like it that you are going to be going through the tibial apophysis, but you are not actually going through the tibial apophysis. So, you know, you are still going within the tibial epiphysis. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that you put your, you get your hand and you put your jig. When you're putting your jig, you elevate the jig and you put your, put your guide pin and you check under fluoro and you will be within the tibial epiphysis. You're not in the apophysial part of the, of the tibial foot where the, where the patellar tendon is. So you're not going through the patellar tendon. You're still going, you know, medial to it when you're drilling it. It seems like you know, you are going into the apophysis, but no, the idea is to be in the epiphysis and not in the apophysis. You can uh, get misjudged, right? Because that laterally, mm -hmm. the lateral view, yeah. it appears, but actually you're not. Yeah, True. you're not, yes. Thank you, Sheetal, for that. And what about return to sport? When you talk about adult ACL injury, we say that ligamentization takes around eight to nine months, right? What about uh, pediatrics? 
It's same. So the retail rates are higher in the pediatric age group compared to the adult age group. So you actually want to inform the family about, you know, I, I tell them three things when it's time to get back to sports. One is that they have to clear all the functional testing, which involves the isometric or the isokinetic testing, hop testing, make sure that the strength is okay, motion is good, the knee is stable. So that's obvious. As far as timing, I would tell them that at six months, they can go back. But if they wait a little bit longer, say nine months or a year, then the rate of retail keeps on going down. So I give them a choice, you know, so if they are not too keen on getting onto competitive sports, then I would like them to wait for a year. But if they are keen, I would allow them to go back out, but I would explain them the options that the rate of retail keeps on going down the further delay they have in return to sports between six months and a year. Now, after one year, it doesn't matter much. You know, it hasn't shown to have significant decrease in retail rates after one year. So I would not delay it more than that. But between six months and a year, my preference is to let them go back at nine months, unless the patient is pushing for it, the patient is very competitive, is on select sports team, has some scholarships based on their return to sports, then yes, uh, with the knowledge that they, there is increased retail rates. The other two things I tell the patient is the use of a functional ACL brace with return to sports. It's an optional thing. It has shown some um, benefits in certain sports like skiing and in certain football positions, but it hasn't shown to have significant decrease in uh, retail rates in sports like, say, basketball or volleyball. So, But if they're going back skiing, then, then it has shown to be beneficial. So I give them the option of using a functional ACL brace. And the last thing is prevention programs. So we are fortunate enough to have prevention programs at our institution. There are a lot of other places that do their own prevention programs where they teach them how to jump and land and neuromuscular conditioning and plyometrics. And that allows them, it has, in, in randomized studies, it has shown to decrease the ACL retail rates. The only thing is that the effect is tentative. So they basically have to do this prevention programs every year or every season rather than just doing it once because the muscles don't remember, you know, your neuromuscular conditioning tends to go back to where it was before, you know, you, you had the injury. So I, I give them the option. I encourage them to get into our prevention programs because that has shown uh, good results. And Sheetal, what about the timing of surgery? Traditionally, we talk about the edema, the subchondral marrow edema to subside. And then, I mean, four to six weeks. What about pediatric? What is the tendency? Yeah, I do tend to delay the surgery for about three or four weeks, just like in adults, unless they have a bucket handle meniscus tear or if a tibial spinal volition injuries, then I tend to go a little bit early. But otherwise, uh, you know, I would like them to do some prehab. I'll send them for a couple of sessions in therapy, let the swelling subside, let the pain be under control and let them regain their motion before I do the ACL. Uh, and Shital, when you talk about revision, now you're a high volume surgeon and there is, I mean, children, you get the, you do the surgery much earlier. The children have the uh, longer period, they play for longer time. And have you encountered revision and what is the scenario? What are the graft options when you go for a revision? That's a good question. Yeah, we have seen, you know, our failures as well as failures from other uh, institutions, uh, you know, that are referred then to our center. So, uh, you, I've, I've done a few other different things. You know, one is in a revision scenario, I would like to make sure that I do the lateral extraticular, you know, augmentation. So whether you do, do a modified Lemaire procedure or you use any other procedure, uh, you know, to, uh, to do an extraticular lateral sided surgery, I always add that. As far as graft options, I've taken contralateral hamstring grafts. But the very good option now that we have is the quadriceps tendon graft. So I would, you know, lean towards quadriceps tendon graft. The one thing that I don't like to do in this patients, which is, you know, which is commonly done in adults here, at least in the U.S., is allograft. Allograft has shown four times higher rates of retears compared to autographs in this younger population. So I tend to remain, you know, I tend to avoid allografts at all costs uh, in, this, in this age group. So if they have had a hamstring graft, then I would do uh, a quadriceps tendon graft. And in younger patients with still open physis, I've, I've used contralateral hamstring as well. But, you know, if, if they are coming to you and now they are around 15 years of age, 
all graft options are open. You can then do a BTB as well. You know, if the if the FICs are almost closed, you know, and you hope that you know it would not be a retear very soon after the primary surgery, then you can use all other options, all graft options, if the physis are almost closed. But if they're open, then you want soft tissue graft and cordyceps tendon graft has, you know, would be my first choice. Thank you, Sheetal. Just one last question before we end up the session. Uh, this is about ACL avulsion injuries, I mean, typical, typical spine fractures. Now, when you talk about arthroscopy in a tibial plateau in an adult, we always say that there's a small risk of a compartment syndrome, right? There's fluid seepage into the compartment. Is there a risk for a tibial spine when you do an uh, arthroscopy? Uh, not really. You know, they don't have as much of a capsular tear or plateau involvement, the typical tibial spine fracture. You know, we just retrospectively reviewed like 90 patients with tibial spine fracture. None of them had any compartment issues or neurovascular issues uh, with these injuries. It can happen if you have a tibial spine as a part of a multi-ligament injury. Like, you know, I've seen that, you know, that you would have tibial spine and then a PCL and then either a lateral or medial sided injury. So if it's a blowout, then you can have it just like you would have for knee dislocation patients. But when tibial spine is an isolated injury, I've not seen compartment syndrome. Thank you, Sheetal. Sheetal, I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this fantastic short talk. Sure. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much for joining in. Thanks for allowing me to present. Thanks for invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.